Imagine you're in a castle where at your very command, a soldier can move exactly three steps forward or a wall could emerge out of nowhere. How about this? You're on a space base and an alien invasion is about to happen. So you have to whip out your little space blaster to protect your, your colony. What, well, when I was nine years old, what fueled my beliefs and let me believe this were Legos. I hope y'all can relate when I say that I have boxes on boxes in my basement with Legos collecting dust. Now, Legos were really not something I enjoyed, but eventually I gained exposure to them. I never started out with big sets with this Lego Coliseum or this Lego Millennium Falcon with a whopping 7,541 pieces. Instead, I had a tiny Lego City police car. Over time, I loved and started to love Legos. I would sit in my basement taking this apart and rebuilding it every single day. Eventually, my addiction got out of hand, and I would build sets with up to three to 4,000 pieces. And I loved it. I would like to have considered myself a master builder, but really, I was just good at following the instructions. I didn't realize it then, but Legos were my first introduction to STEM, particularly mathematics. You may not see it now, but every single time you're building a Lego house, you're actually solving a math problem. You need to be asking yourself, am I optimizing my pieces correctly? You may moan and groan, think about all the optimization problems you've done in math, but really, Legos are just one of the many ways we can see the mathematical applications in the real world. My love for Legos led me to look at other areas where we don't traditionally look at math. So we'll start off with our first example. In this image, you can see a busy intersection. Now, when you're crossing a road, you need to be aware of several factors. The velocity and acceleration of oncoming traffic, how far the other side of the road is, and how fast you can go to the other side of the road. All these factors play a part in solving a mathematical problem. In calculus, there's a subfield called differential calculus, and within it are these nasty looking equations called partial differential equations. Half of us don't even know what they are, but every single time we're crossing a road, we're solving one of these. You need to be aware that everything that's going around you plays a factor. Nowadays, companies like Tesla are building self-driving cars. These cars need to be aware of other cars around them, pedestrians, stop signs, traffic lights, so much more. And they're using these factors into solving partial differential equations. They also are using it for their batteries. They're making their batteries more energy efficient so you can travel further on a single charge. Now, that's a very complex topic in a complex field. So we'll be looking at something easier, something more common languages or linguistics. We know there's several different languages or multiple different languages all over the world and especially spoken in the US. There's several different dialects too. And what we can look at with a combination of mathematics and linguistics is computational linguistics. Within it, you can see applications through chatbots and translation software and we'll be looking at their limitations through this presentation. Now what is linguistics? Linguistics is the study of language and its structure. And as I had said, there's thousands of languages all over the world. And what they all share are common patterns. What we'll be observing are conjugations. So I know all of y'all know English by now, so we'll be looking at a different language, French. Here are a list of seven French verbs. And on the screen, you can look at their conjugations. You can see they're all conjugated with respect to subjects. You can see je, which means I, tu, which means you, and so on and so forth. All of them correspond, but what are we going to do here exactly? Let's look at some patterns here. You can see on the screen, four of these verbs have the same endings, E, E, S, E, O, N, S, E, Z, E, N, T. But how can we classify this? So let's look at the verbs. With the verbs, you can see all four of them end in ER. Thus, we can call them regular ER verbs. However, there are always exceptions to rules. That's why we have verbs such as aller, which ends in er, but doesn't follow the same pattern. Now, going back to the list of conjugated verbs, you can see the other three all end in ir. So we can call them all ir, regular ir verbs, right? That's where you're wrong. Again, looking at the endings, two of them share the similar endings, calling them regular ir verbs, while one of them differs. We can call that an irregular. But how does this relate to mathematics, or where is the mathematics in this? We just looked at different patterns that, are, that came up in linguistics. And mathematics, it's crucial that we look at patterns. Pattern recognition is vital. Mathematics itself is inherently a universal language. It doesn't change wherever you go. 
So this year in differential equations, we looked at several different DEs. We looked at separable, linear, and homogeneous DEs, all of these having these weird, wacky forms. But again, we needed to be able to identify what type of differential equations they are so we could solve them and follow the proper steps. Now, on to chatbots and translation softwares. How are they limited? Nowadays, translation softwares try to directly translate one sentence to another in a given language. So this sentence in French, je mange du poulet, translates to I eat chicken. But if we're directly translating it word for word, you see I means je, eat means ma mange, and chicken for du poulet. But the thing is, two words for one, that doesn't directly correspond. That's because translation softwares don't often account for prepositional phrases like do. That's where they're limited, and that's where we need to be looking at these irregularities. Now, linguistics and languages aren't the only ways we can see math. We can see math in music as well. When I grew up, I was forced to learn the violin in elementary school. I didn't know anything about it. All I knew, I had to check if it was long enough, too short, or how to play with the bow, but that's about it. I never knew anything else. But in, in music, we have to look at some prerequisites, such as the Fibonacci sequence. Now, what is the Fibonacci sequence? Each number in the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the two numbers before it. So we start with 0 and 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3, so on and so forth. Here we can see the Fibonacci spiral, which represents this. We commonly hear the Fibonacci sequence or the Fibonacci spiral in nature, such as a sunflower, or seashells. But for this presentation or this talk, we're going to be looking about the Fibonacci sequence in music. When you look at a piano, there are 13 keys in an octave. Eight of them are white, five of them are black. Hmm, five, eight, and 13. Definitely seen those before. That's right, they're all Fibonacci numbers. In a violin or any stringed instrument, you can see the ratio from the neck to the body, which is represented by A1 to A2, is equivalent to the golden ratio. But what is the golden ratio? The golden ratio is approximately 1.618. And every iteration of the Fibonacci sequence, if you divide two consecutive numbers by each other, say 8 by 5 or 13 by 8, you will get closer and closer to the golden ratio. But where does this play a role in music? Where else? So we'll be looking at the inverse of the golden ratio. The golden ratio is denoted by phi, so the inverse would be 1 over phi, or approximately 0.618. Nowadays in music, we anticipate some sort of beat drop, some sort of instrument change, or a change from high to low in the song, just like we do in a novel or in a movie. We anticipate the main character to face some challenge. All of this occurs around 60% of the way into the song or the novel. So now let's look at some real life examples. Here we have number one by Imagine Dragons. This song has a length of three minutes and 25 seconds, which is 205 seconds. Multiplying it by the inverse of phi, we get 125, which is approximately two minutes and four seconds. Now, I'm gonna go into this clip of the song at 157 to 208, and from there, we can visualize where this occurs. In this song, which you commonly may not have heard of, you can notice a change in the instrument. You can change, you can hear the change in the music. And this occurs at that moment in time when you multiply it by the inverse of phi. This is known as the phi moment in a song, or the golden moment. Now let's look at another example which y'all may have heard or are more familiar with, Hotline Bling by Drake. Again, the length of the song is three minutes and 52 seconds. Multiplying this, or the time in seconds, by the inverse of phi, you get two minutes and 23 seconds. Now looking at this moment in time, again in the song, you can see my, my cell phone. Late night when you need my love. And I know when that hotline bling. That can only be one thing. I know when that hotline bling. So you heard the music change. You heard how the, the, the drums started getting included later on after a moment in time. This is 60% of the way through the song at the Phi moment. Now looking at our final song, which I hope all of you know, Levitating by Dua Lipa, the length of this song is four minutes and 25 seconds. Multiplying it by the inverse of Phi once again gets you two minutes and 43 seconds. You will notice that here there's a change in the song. Now looking at the snippet of the song 
from 235 to 251. You can hear it yourselves. Moonlight, you're my starlight. I need you all night. Come on, dance with me. I'm levitating. You can fly away with me tonight. You can fly away with me tonight. Baby, let me take you for a ride. Yeah, yeah. So you heard where that happened. And I hope you understand that the phi moment may be intentionally or unintentionally placed by the producers, but nowadays you, New York Academy students, can place it and make, it, make your song more appealing intentionally so that in competitions such as the NA Factor, which is coming up, you can do much better. Now, from this talk, I hope you all recognize that math occurs in places we don't traditionally address it. So now, when you go about in your day-to-day -day lives, hopefully you look for it. Thank you.